This next talk is a, is a Julia case study in the uh, pharmaceutical um, industry. In particular, we are building a Bayesian nonlinear mixed effects model to improve um, powder storage. So um, powders are used all over the, the pharmaceutical industry to make um, tablets and, and pills. Uh, and they are typically stored in silos. So to visualize a silo, you just think like these large grain silos that you might be familiar with from um, agriculture. It's basically um, the same thing. And then models are, uh, are useful to judge the, the safety of the silos, that the silo does not tip over or um, collapse, for example. And uh, for powders, this uh, is typically done using um, the Janssen equation. And this Janssen equation contains um, unknown parameters which must be estimated from experimental data, and particularly the K, the A, and the B values we are interested in calibrating. Um, to this end, we have a first measurement set up here, where we again have um, powder um, in a silo, in a column. But the new thing is here that um, a force is applied at the top um, of, the, of the silo, which causes the powder um, to compress. And then what we end up measuring is the height of the, um, the, the powder at equilibrium and also the force um, at the bottom. Uh, we can build a model for this by um, considering an infinitesimally uh, small layer of the powder and to look at the force balance uh, of that layer. There are, there are all kinds of um, forces acting here, uh, for example, a, a gravity force and also um, a friction force. Using this uh, force balance, you can come up with a differential equation. And if you solve this differential equation, you end up with um, this equation here for um, the force or the stress at the bottom of the silo. This equation is very similar to the one I showed on the previous slide, except that here it takes into account this uh, force that is applied at the top of the column. And then we gather measurements uh, for a variety of different forces. Uh, applied at the top, and then again, the goal is to estimate this K, A, and B parameter, except there is an issue here in this equation, in that the K and the A parameter always occur together in the uh, equation, and this means that um, the model is unidentifiable. There is an infinite, um, there are infinite uh, combinations of K and A, which all uh, fit the data equally uh, well. And um, yet to remedy this situation, we had to come up with a second measurement um, setup. Um, what, we see, what we see here is that we now apply a force um, to the powder. Um, and then what we measure is, um, is the friction force on the wall of the silo. And as you push harder on the power, of course, the amount of friction also um, goes up. And this is modeled well with just a simple linear um, regression um, model. Um, and um, we repeated um, this sequence of measurements where we um, push harder and harder on the power um, three different times. And then we noticed that um, measurements coming from the same uh, repetition are more similar to one another than measurements coming from different um, repetitions. What do I mean by that exactly? Well, uh, for example, in the first repetition, uh, those are the, uh, the dots in blue. Those dots are always at the bottom of each of these three points. Then for the second repetition, the measurements in orange, those are always at the top of each of these three uh, measurements. So there is definitely some additional structure present in the data, which means that it is likely a good idea to introduce a, a random effect into the model. Um, this means that... Um, this slope A here is no longer just a single value, but now we say that for each repetition of the experiment, A uh, is uh, drawn from a, a possible distribution of slopes, typically a normal distribution with a mean and a standard deviation. And then the goal shifts towards no, um, estimating this mean and this um, standard deviation. So uh, about this, the previous slide, um, I said that the model was not identifiable because the K and the A always um, occur um, together. 
Um, here in this equation, we see that um, the A is present uh, alone, so it does not have this identifiability issue, at least regarding the A, but um, the K is not present at all in this equation here, so we can't estimate K from this um, setup. So we see that only considering the first measurement second or um, considering only the second measurement setup will never allow us to estimate all three parameters of interest, the K, the A, and the B. So we somehow need to come up with a way of um, joining these two data sets um, together. And this is why we used Bayesian um, statistics. And um, for Bayesian um, inference, you always need two ingredients. The first ingredient is uh, prior information. We had bones available for all of the parameters of interest, so that can serve as a, as a prior. Um, and then the second ingredient is the likelihood. And uh, in particular here, it is not that difficult to calculate the joint likelihood of both measurement setups um, together. This is in contrast to if you um, took a more traditional statistical approach using a frequentist statistics, coming up with a way um, to quantify uncertainty there for both of the uh, measurement setups together would be quite difficult to achieve. But with Bayesian uh, methods, it, it goes kind of automatically. And then um, the most important um, part of this talk, at least for this conference, is why did we um, choose Julia to implement this? Well, the main reason is the excellent um, Turing uh, package for uh, Bayesian inference, which works well out of the box with differential equations. Um, I mentioned previously that, um, that these force balances uh, are related um, to differential equations. Now, in this case, it turned out that the, the equations were simple enough to, to solve by hand, so that we did not end up needing differential equations. But at the start of the project, um, we did not know that. And there are also extensions to these models um, which, are where, which lead to differential equations not um, solvable by hand. Um, then uh, another important consideration was that um, the scientists and the, and the engineers doing hands-on work uh, with, with these uh, silos, they are familiar uh, with MATLAB. And um, yeah, um, the Turing syntax is quite similar um, to, to uh, to, to what they are familiar with in MATLAB, at least more familiar than, uh, for example, using another Bayesian inference package um, like STAN. Um, indeed, um, the Turing code is, is uh, very concise and very legible. So on the left-hand side, you see the full mathematical description of the model that we ended up using. And on the right-hand side, you see the Turing code implementation. And you see that it is almost a line-by-line -line, um, comparison. For example, here, the first line, this prior um, distribution for MK, this equation here is almost exactly the same. Very similar for this likelihood equation for tau. The equation you see here is almost exactly um, the same. For this reason, we were able to quickly iterate um, quickly iterate on this uh, model, which then led it to good end results. I don't have the time to, to do a deep uh, analysis um, here of, of the uh, results, but um, um, to just to summarize things, we ended up with um, nice posterior distributions for all three of the, uh, of the parameters of interest, the K, the A, um, and the B. Um, thank you for your attention.